You play a game with me, Ray? No. I said play a f game with me, Ray. Right. Lovely. Whenever a new show or film comes out, regardless of any great source material it's adapted from, a wave of skepticism befalls you. The number of times fans have been left disappointed, or in the case of specific big franchises, have been directly attacked for no other reason than adhering and explaining what the law should be, I've, I've lost count of how many. But then, it's not all so bad. Because every once in a while, a small ray of light manages to pierce through that grungy Hollywood exterior to give us something truly epic. And that epic show is The Gentleman. This is a more fleshed out retelling of a similar story to the one presented to us in the 2019 movie of the same name. It follows Theo James's character, Eddie Halstead, who transforms from a middle-ranked aristocrat to a top drug-peddling entrepreneur. We see a vast group of different characters ranging from different members of his family, his servants, enemies, or as Hugh Grant's character in the original movie would say, his licorice assortment of tasty mates. The editing and production of this series, I kid you not, is so sharp that if it was done on a smaller budget, you wouldn't be able to tell. I'm willing to wager it wasn't huge, and yet they've done so much. There isn't a single episode I felt was dull or slow or had anything of any significance to criticize. The plot was consistent, the characters all interesting for various reasons. More crucially, each one served a purpose rather than being there to make up the numbers or by for reasons of PC culture. Everything was there for a reason. Guy Ritchie has assembled his own screenwriting Avengers in this case. People who work well when changing from one writer in an episode to another, from one director to another. Because remember, Ritchie only fully wrote and directed the first two episodes. The rest he handed over to the rest of the writing production team. There are these small callbacks you notice to Ritchie's previous work in the form of easter eggs that are very easy to overlook. For example, the phrase, it's been emotional, was used, which is the same phrase as Vinnie Jones's character in Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels. It's been emotional. It's been emotional, Captain. There seems to be a character for everyone to get behind, no matter who it is, to either love or hate, doesn't matter what. Something for any type of audience member to latch onto. I couldn't help but notice, because I wasn't watching this alone, you see, that the other people who were watching the show with me were sympathising with two distinctly different characters, yet their reasons for sympathising were the same. But they never did react the same way with each other's preferred characters. It was so bizarre, yet such a learning experience. No one cares. As I said, the series keeps you hooked, especially when it starts throwing you curveballs like... What happened to a certain character's brother late in the series? I don't want to go into details because I want you to watch it. That incident changes the entire dynamic, makes you root for different people. This is what I have come to love and expect from a Guy Ritchie endorsed production. But more importantly, this method of storytelling should lead the way. It should be adopted by everyone. Suck my great tits, Hollywood pinkos. But sadly, it still only resides with Guy Ritchie. Now, as I say, I don't want to reveal too much of what goes on as I want everyone to go watch and support this series and make sure that there will be a series too. But just to whet your appetite a bit, let me go over just three moments that make the series stand out to me. I think you all agree that a series can often make or break judging how the main narrative is set up. And in this case, we spend no more than five minutes on the opening setup to get to the first part of the main plot. This is where clever editing comes into play because Richie opens up the episode on the Turkish border with Eddie in his chosen profession as the United Nations peace enforcer. <coughs> worker, sorry, worker. A car then pulls up to his checkpoint to inform him that his father is dying and he has been relieved of duty on compassionate grounds. Now, in many films and shows, getting from this point being point A to get into the father on his deathbed calling that point B, can often be drawn out and made dull by modern shows that insist on showing the actual journey. Not here. 
As I said, the clever editing's at play, and that clever editing shows Eddie being in one car in full uniform, then flips to another car in civilian clothing, pulling up to the family mansion upon which the title credits begin. This simple technique has allowed for more relevant dialogue to exist and set up to begin faster, in which during the next 10 minutes, the majority of all the main characters get introduced via the funeral for the father and the subsequent reading of the will afterwards. The opening to this episode caught me off guard. Now, while episode 1 set the tone and episodes 2 and 3 continued the plot very handsomely, episode 4's opening throws us a curveball in the shape of a, uh, hmm, a naked geriatric man brandishing a set of grenades, various different military paraphernalia, and what looks like a WW2 MP38 that he consequently starts running with, shooting at Taurus, and then proceeds to keel over and, well, die. Yeah, welcome to Guy Ritchie's world. It's been emotional. Though additional credit does go to Nemo Norizoda for the great direction, as well as Matthew Reed and Billy and Theo Mason Wood for the writing. What this moment demonstrates is you just don't know what you're going to get with this series, and it kept me hooked yet again all the way to the end. I couldn't keep my eyes off. I binge-watched this thing all the way through. And speaking of ends... I don't think I need to tell anyone that if you're going to have a great opener, great middle section, you need a nice crisp end to tighten the bow just right. This series delivers in all three acts. It was left in a position that if a series 2 is not made, that it ends perfectly fine, but open enough for something new to happen. And by God, I hope they make another. The full scheme is realised, and one scene in particular does demonstrate to me that they were indeed working to a budget, but the plot was clever enough to take that into account which only serves to prove that to have a hit on your hands you don't need inflated budgets in movies or shows two sometimes 300 million for a film this is used for nothing more than bloated salaries which you wouldn't need to spend if you get the right balance between established actors and actresses and those who want to try to break the market now i have tried my damnedest to make this spoiler free as much as i can just giving you a little taste of what you have in store for you when watching now, what I'm about to say is just my opinion, so feel free to disagree, but I do firmly believe that this is probably the best series Netflix has had commissioned, or paid for, or whatever. Stranger Things had one good season, and then it went both repetitive and dull for me. Cobra Kai is good, but it is not perfect. Whereas to me, this series right now is perfect. Now, I hope the series stays true to what it is when a series 2 comes its way, and if it doesn't, well... I will hold my hands up and say, yes, they fucked up. But for now, at least, go, watch, and enjoy. And you know what? I think I'm going to go and watch it for a third time. I hope you enjoyed listening to this. Thank you for watching, and do take care.